morning. Good morning. How are we all doing today? Oh, it's so nice to see some rain. I feel like I'm a little hot right now. All right, there we go. <clears throat> I always get the mic in the wrong spot. Jill said, Jill, let you know there's coffee? All right, cool. I'll, uh, there might still be some left. I've, I've had me a, a fair share, so hopefully there's still some left for y'all. Um, but I'm excited today. I'm going to be honest. I'm stoked right now. We got rain. We got friends. We got coffee. And I get to teach. I'm excited. Uh, God's put a, a word in my heart for this series and for today, and I believe for you. Um, and I got to prepare this message with one of my good friends, Joe Gruber, who's down visiting. So that was fun. It's my first time co-writing a message with Joe. Let me tell you, I'll give you his email if it's not a good message so that you could let him know. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> so we are in a series on spiritual gifts or gifts right now. Last week, Chris covered some motivational gifts. This week, we're going to our spiritual gifts gifts from God to you to edify and build the kingdom. Now, I might be one of the hardest people to buy a gift for. I go into full detective mode when I know there's a gift. See, if I don't know that there's a gift, it's a surprise, I'm, I'm easy peasy. But when I know, like Christmas is coming or my birthday is coming, or someone goes, oh, I got you a gift, but you got to wait. Please don't do that to me. Don't do that to yourself. I am an amazing detective. Like, I think I might have missed my calling. Like, if you just told me that there was a gift at the end of the crime, I would solve everything. There would be no CSI. You wouldn't need it. You would just, I would figure it out. And what's really hard for Jill, so pray for her, is that this is also my love language, is, is gifts. And so I ruin my own love language because Jill will get me a gift and then I will figure it out. And so it's really hard for her. We gotta pray for her. Keep her in your prayers for sure. She's gotten me a couple times. She's gotten me a couple times. One time it was my birthday and I knew that she was getting me something because it's my birthday. I, I get myself stuff for my birthday. And I had no idea. I couldn't figure it out. Every avenue that I had, I had pursued, I couldn't figure this gift out. And then it's, it's raining, pouring rain, way more than today. Like windshield wipers on high, still can't see. And it's dark because my birthday's in January. And we're driving from Gilray to San Jose. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Maybe she's taking me to a concert. And I start going through my, the bands that I know that are in town that I would want to see, that she would also tolerate seeing. And... <laughs> It's just not, nothing's lining up. And then she ended up taking me to my favorite restaurant, Kyoto Palace in, in, um, in Campbell at the Prune Yard. It's amazing. It's one of those places where they cook the food right in front of you and flip the eggs and make the, it's awesome. It's kind of like Benihana's, but better. And so we go there. That was like the only time she's been able to surprise me. Other than that, I just ruin every gift. She almost doesn't even try to surprise me anymore. She just goes, I know you're going to figure it out, so I'll just give it to you early. And then it ruins the fun for her kind of ruins the fun for me. But so, do you, all, do you all know what it's like to have a, the excitement and the anticipation of a gift? I mean, we're coming into the holiday season. Are you a gift giver? Is that the anticipation and the excitement is to see someone's reaction when they open up that amazing, wonderful, heartfelt, thought poured into gift? I mean, we all understand the value of a gift, not the price tag of a gift, but the value of a gift. It's a little different, huh? Sometimes the, the sweetest things cost zero dollars. So it's not about the price, it's about the value. And you, you see, we also learn this from God. God gives us gifts that are of value, not just with a price tag, but something inside of us, deposited in us for value and of value, for us to step into our purpose. I remember uh, one Christmas, I was maybe seven years old. And I, I mean, we didn't grow up with a lot of money, so, but I didn't know that. My parents were super awesome about it. So there's some stuff that I just assumed weren't gonna be under my Christmas tree. 
right? I remember the first time I got a pair of Vans. I'm in Santa Cruz County. I can talk about that. I'm a Jordans guy, but Vans still hold a dear place in my heart. My grandma bought me a pair of Vans. It was the coolest thing ever. But one Christmas when I was about seven years old, we opened up all of our gifts, and it was, you know, your basic stuff, a, a shirt here, a book there, just nice, simple things. And then me and my brother were, I'll be honest, we were a little let down because we had a big list. I mean, you're seven years old. The, 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 the sky's the limit on what you ask for, what you write on your letter to Santa, right? We had this huge list, and we got, we got some stuff on it. I think I, I got some, you know, like a new cleats or something. We got some, we got some good stuff. But I was like, man, I didn't get the one big gift. You guys know that one? Like, either your kids or you, you write down the one big gift you really want. Well, we didn't get it. And then there's this card in the tree with these instructions in it. And my parents did a scavenger hunt on Christmas Eve, because we, we're weird. We open our presents on Christmas Eve. I have zero patience. We open our gifts on Christmas Eve. And so Christmas Eve night, we're just on this scavenger hunt going through the house, going in the garage, going through the backyard for clues and picking up new notes to take us to a new spot to get a new clue. Maybe this is where I learned how to be a detective for my gift is it's just ingrained in me as a child because I had to pursue this scavenger hunt to find a Sega Genesis. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna be dating ourselves a little bit. If you know what a Sega Genesis is, raise your hand. You're either young enough to know what it is or you're old enough to be like, okay, I bought my kids that. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog, we're talking the good games. We're talking, we're talking, you're, you have a, a six-foot cable, and that's all you got. You, it, it's awesome. That and Nintendo 64, that's when games were good. Now they're too real. They're not even fun anymore. It's like, I'm scared by the graphics. <laughs> but I remember being like seven years old and finding the Sega Genesis and how excited we were. And then we got to plug it in and stay up late and play video games like we had never played before. My brother and I were so thrilled. And my parents, they got to see us have that moment. I mean, I remember exactly which cabinet it was in the house I was in when I was seven. I remember everything so vivid because it was so impactful to my life. You have a gift inside of you. Or, or gifts inside of you that you get to seek out and find and feel that moment of excitement, empowerment, and joy when you discover it and then get to give it. That's the beauty of gifts. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, read this. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to view in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have a different perspective. See things differently. It's not about me. It's about we. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God gives us things so that his pleasing and perfect will can be done. And how cool is it that the God who can do it invites us to partner in that? I mean, it's probably a good thing that I'm not God because I'd be like, no, 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 you'll mess it up. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Just my way, please. Do it my way, please. I, that's how I would, I, I wouldn't invite people to get messy. I would keep it nice and clean. Uh, OCD freak. Uh, CDO, actually. But um, you'll get that later. It'll hit you. So let's look at these spiritual gifts and God's will for them. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge 
by means of the same Spirit, another faith, by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing, by that one Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, and another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as he determines. I love how everyone gets a gift. Remember back in school when you would bring something and the teacher would say, did you bring enough to share with the class? I never did. <laughs> Even if I had enough, I didn't. No, kidding. Kind of, maybe. If we were in class together, lie for me, cover for me. So I, I looked up the, the Greek word on some, of these, um, on some of these things. So the word gift, the Greek word, the, the language that Paul was using when he was talking about gifts, translates the word charisma. And it's a gift of grace. It's a free gift. And it's, it's used as undeserved favor. See, we, we, we might hear gift and think a new bike, or think a Sega Genesis, or think something someone wrapped and gave me. But see, when, when we look at, look at the words that were used when it was written, we're actually seeing this, this undeserved favor, this grace, which kind of ch changed my perspective on, on these gifts, changed my understanding of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in and through me, is that He's giving me a measure of grace that I don't deserve to do things that I can't do on my own. And so that's the biggest gift of all, is to be invited into this process, is to be given salvation through Jesus and then invited into the process of restoring humanity. Talk about undeserved favor. Hello, I'm the reason Jesus had to die, and then he invites me in to help people. That just doesn't make sense to me, but it does with Jesus. It's this undeserved grace that we have. And then so from gift, we get grace. And so I decided to look into grace and that we get the word charis, which is kindness. And it's used as a gift or blessing brought to man by Jesus Christ. Favor or gratitude, favor and kindness. These, this gift of grace is just so miraculous in itself that Jesus, Jesus would give me life and then ask me to join the mission, ask you to be a part of it, and then give you grace and gifts that will help accomplish it. It's just, it's, it's mind-boggling to think that in you, are purposes to someone's salvation and eternal blessing with God. There's a little gravity there, isn't there? A little weight to that. And one thing I love about, about these gifts is they're God's design. God designed them. God designed who gets them, how much, when, where, what. It's all by God's design. Let me tell you, his track record, pretty stellar. He's batting a thousand with his designs. Now, humanity, not such a good track record. We are striking out big time. We shouldn't say we. I strike out daily. Uh, I need, I need, I'm a golfer, so I, I take lots of mulligans. But Psalm 139, verse 13 through 14 says this about God's design. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God's works are wonderful. You are wonderful. And his gifts are wonderful. They're by design for you. And you're the best at being you on this earth. 
No one else can do what you've been called to do. There might be people that can do similar things in the same giftings, but not in the same lane and with the same grace to the same people. Only you can do what God's asked you to do with the tools and the resources he's designed for you. You see, for we are God's handiwork, <clears throat> created in Christ Jesus to do good works. If you came here looking for what you were supposed to do with your life, right there, good works. That's your purpose in life, to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. That's, that, that, I love that about design, is that you have to prepare it in advance. You have to think about it and plan it out before you can even see it. You have to have that, that next level thinking to, to design something. Like inventors, like Thomas Edison, had to see what he wanted to achieve before he achieved it. That's what design takes, and God sees what he's planned for you. God sees the path to get there and wants you to ask him the directions. He wants to share that with you. Just as my parents wanted to share that gift with me, he wants to share your purpose and your plan through his design. And he, God doesn't only design, but God also aligns. So it's by God's design and then God's aligning. Anyone ever driven a car where the, the wheels got out of alignment? It's, it's gnarly, isn't it? Like, depending on how bad it is, like, how hard did you hit that curb? Or how bad did you go over that median? How hard did you have to swerve, hit the e-brake, pull the slide? It's raining out there. Don't, it's not, let's be safe. Let's be safe. But once you take your hands off that wheel, which I don't advise, and you start drifting and leaning, or you start getting that, like, little, kind of, I call it a gangster lip, like, <laughs> as you drive, Right? Your alignment is so far out of place that you can't go straight. And left on that course long enough, you'll crash. But the gift of alignment helps your wear and tear, helps your, your direction, helps your steering and your navigation all work properly. One slight tweak in alignment, nothing works like it's supposed to. Sounds kind of like how we, humanity, sinned and threw the alignment of God's plan off. How through my sin, I brought death and darkness to my life. How in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, it brought death to humanity. Kind of seems like we hit a curb pretty hard and threw the car out of alignment. So what, what was God's design to get us back into alignment? Right here, we see it in John verses, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's how we get in, back into alignment with God, is through the covering of Jesus through the death and resurrection of Jesus. The sinless one taking on my sin so that I can be with him in paradise forever. And one of the coolest words in the Bible is, it is finished. My sin is finished. I might still sin, but God's so sovereign. God's so gracious. God's so caring. And he gives so many gifts of grace that my sin is finished. Your sin is finished. The blood of Jesus is covering your life. That's how we get back into alignment, is surrendering our will to God's will. Just saying, I messed up. I don't have the answers. I hit the curb. Help me, Jesus. So it brings us back. So once, <clears throat> once we're in alignment with God, now what? Anyone ever ask that question? I'm a big now what guy. I'm a big, but why? 
What's the purpose? Come on, what's next? I'm, I'm, a, I'm huge. I'm sometimes obnoxiously annoying in a project. I'm like, well, what's what next? Now what? So if we're in alignment with God, is it all just overdone? Why are we still here after we say yes to Jesus? I've asked that question legitimately, like, well, is it, if it's just a get out of hell free card, why do I stay here? Well, because it's not just a get out of hell free card. It's an invitation into a relationship. And let me tell you, when, when I started dating Jill, I wanted to be around her as much as possible because that was an invitation into a new relationship. I wanted to stick around. Still want to, don't worry, still want to. I, I use past tense there. No, 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 it's present, it's present tense. <clears throat> but God then assigns us. God then assigns us tasks, opportunities, invitations, roles. God assigns us stuff. And we see that in two very, very, very important things. The great commandments, love God and love people, and the great commission to take the, take the gospel into all the world. That's where we see our assignments. We've been aligned with Jesus, and our assignment is to make heaven crowded. I love that phrase. I heard it from a friend. I love that phrase. <clears throat> Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let us be known as people of love. People who love others so well that it feels like a gift. It's a supernatural love that is just beyond what we can understand. Let our lives be, be flavored with grace. That the, the tone that we even speak is kind and loving. And then Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, like loving God and loving people. Teach them to love God. Teach them to love people. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How cool is that? That God, God promises to be with you every step of the way. You always have a safety net under you. Step out. You're not going to get hurt. Step into your gifting. You're a 10 somewhere. Guarantee it. You are a 10 somewhere. That's on a scale of 1 to 10 too. That's pretty good. I mean, if it was a scale of 1 to 100, like, yeah, 10, I, I mean, yeah, I could do that. And I love that, that the passage in 1 Corinthians that we were looking at, 12, of the, of the spiritual gifts, I love that it is, it's on the heels of, not, the, not rules or order, but like the, the how to properly worship God in a community of people. And then it's right before unity in the body. Seems like it's sandwiched right, be, right between loving God and loving people. These gifts. It's like the stuffing in the Oreo, the good part. It's right there in between loving God and loving people. The how to love God and the how to love people is right there. And I love that these gifts are intended to unify the body. It breaks my heart that there are so many people that are using God-given gifts to bring division. It breaks my heart that there are people who are using God-given gifts to lie to people. Because the gifts that God gave us, the grace that he has for you, is to build each other up in the name of Jesus. To love people so well that they ask so much questions about who is this Jesus that is giving you this grace. That's, that's what my, my love and my heart is, that we would be a unified body, that we would use our gifts together to accomplish more, that we would go further, farther together, and that we would unify to multiply. That way we can achieve and be a partner in the invitation God has given us to seek and save the lost. 
to help people find and follow Jesus. Because we need every hand, every foot, every eye, every spleen, every pancreas. We need it all. We need it all to be a healthy, functioning body. And you're a part of that body. You're a part of that body. We want to be on a team together so that we can multiply, so we can grow, so that heaven is crowded. I hope there's a line around the pearly gates to get in. Because you know that's the best club in, the, in town is when the line's around the corner, right? You know that's the best club in the, in, in the neighborhood. So f- 1 Corinthians 14 says, follow the way of love and eagerly, eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Eagerly desire. I mean, seek after, ask for, plead, beg, especially for prophecy. Anyone, when they hear the word prophecy or hear like a prophet, think something a little different? Like if you ever watched the show, like uh, I'm going to, Vikings? You've seen these prophets in that? Or you've seen like maybe some other, um, some other old time historical shows or some embellishments through Hollywood where prophets are a little kooky, a little weird, a little off, a little in their own tent and it's kind of dark and mysterious, Ooh, right? I get you on that. Can I, can I, can I ask you to, to lean in and hear what the Bible says about prophets and prophecy? Can I, can I ask you to, to just kind of be open to a shift of perspective? Because I, I, get it, I get it all well and good when I'm watching TV and you got you to gotta make a character a little mysterious. I get it. But when it comes to the Bible, I like to make things uncomplicated. I like to make things simple. And so I love this passage in Revelation 19 at the end of verse 10. For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. That seems doable. That seems simple. Doesn't seem creepy, mysterious, or different. Doesn't seem like I got to live in a shack outside of town by myself. Doesn't sound like that. It sounds like I just got to clearly communicate who Jesus is in my life, and what Jesus has done for me in my life. I can do that. And when Paul says to, to, eagerly desire the gifts, especially prophecy. And then you have this new understanding of what prophecy is, eagerly desire to share Jesus with people. We're all prophets when we share Jesus clearly. And it's doable. And it's not weird. It's simple. And the Greek word, the Greek definition and usage of prophecy is the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth. Communicating revealed truth. Jesus has revealed his truth in my life through the salvation of my soul, and I can communicate that. I can tell people, yep, it was Jesus. It's always only Jesus. I can can tell people, where I got the water for life. I can tell people where I got the bread to sustain me in hard times. I can tell people how I can be joyful in the midst of trial and suffering. And I can share the supernatural gifts with people to build them up. You have a gift. They're meant to bring value to the kingdom of God. You bring value. I want you to hear that. You bring value to this community. You bring value to this this kingdom. And don't let the lies convince you that you're anything other than necessary to the expansion of the kingdom. You are necessary to God's plan for humanity. You matter. You're of value. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your love, your grace, Lord, that you would align us 
to the Father. That you would, you would make a way for us to, to have a relationship with God. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us. That each and every one of us have a measure of grace on our life to be a part of your redemption story, Jesus. And I want to give a moment right now that if you, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus and you want that relationship with Jesus, you want to step into the grace of salvation through him with every eye closed and head bowed, I want to give you that opportunity right now to, to simply say yes to Jesus. It doesn't have to be long and poetic. It just has to be honest. And it's acknowledging that you're a sinner just like me in need of a savior named Jesus. And then you, you believe that he took your sin and he beat hell and the grave and rose again. And you commit your life to follow him and to, to use your giftings to tell people about him. I want to give you that moment. If that was you that, that had that moment right now where you said yes to Jesus, I'd love to partner with you. So if you would raise your hand or make eye contact with me so we can, we can not do life alone. We can help you not just find but follow Jesus as well. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Jesus, thank you. Yes, amen. Amen. You're gifted, you're loved, you're a value. I hope you hear that. You're worth Jesus to God. You are worth Jesus to God. If that was you, I'd love to have you connect at the table after church or go to the prayer corner with, with Cara and Rosa right now, and they would love to share life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.